imagine anything else that you would write? I'll mute everybody in just a second. Okay, awesome. Okay, and we are recording, so good stuff. So welcome everybody uh, to our first Jiu-Jitsu history class. I'm really excited to be here, excited to see some, uh, so many of y'all, some of y'all I've known for a long time, some of you uh, I don't know at all. So it's really cool to see everybody, you know, we all share a passion for Jiu-Jitsu history. Uh, I'll share the presentation in just a second, but I want to explain like personally why I love Jiu-Jitsu history so much. Obviously we all love Jiu-Jitsu or not, wouldn't be on this call, uh, but it's a fascinating thing. And to me, Jiu-Jitsu and history have two things in common, a, a lot of things in common, but two big things. Uh, the first thing, really larger than life figures. Heroes aren't always good or bad. They're just excessive. And you, see, you see that in uh, Greek myths. You see that in, in Norwegian myths. And you see it in a lot of the founding fa fathers of jiu-jitsu. And so there's all these amazing stories about them and reading and really makes the, the history come to life for me. The second thing is we're still learning a ton about it. And one thing that I'm going to talk about regularly is uh, not during this presentation, but on social media and forever is Robert Drysdale's documentary, Closed Guard, that's coming out this summer. We're learning so much from the original research that he's doing. I think the film is going to be amazing. Really encourage y'all to support that. And also want to acknowledge the work of Jose Tufi Cairus uh, and Roberto Pedrera, who have done really groundbreaking stuff. There's links to their work in the presentation and on the blog. So if you want to check that out further, I know some of you probably have already. It's incredibly useful. would encourage you to support um, that stuff as well. So with that being said, let's talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and how uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu became Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I'm going to share my screen with y'all and I'm going to share, okay, this, and this should do it. Okay, awesome. Let's go back to the beginning of the presentation. So jiu-jitsu changed the world, and it was changed by it. As I say in the blog post accompanying this, anybody that tells you that jiu-jitsu history isn't political history is selling something, because martial arts evolve based on the societies that they evolve in. Um, for every job, there is a perfect tool, and for every purpose, there is a perfect art, and arts evolve as societies evolve. So that's one of the exciting things about being a part of jiu-jitsu history is that we, this is an art that we are co-evolving and co-creating today. So we're learning more and more about this stuff all the time. So this particular story is about how Japanese jiu-jitsu came from Japan and became Brazilian jiu-jitsu and how BJJ then moved to America and contributed to the rise of mixed martial arts. Most of y'all know we're doing a class every Tuesday night uh, for the month of June. This is our sort of we're doing 500 years of history in one class, so we're not going to be able to go in depth on too much. But if you are interested, every other class uh, this week is going to do a deeper dive on some of the important periods of jujitsu history. But I want to say something about why martial arts um, evolve depending on the need of their societies. Um, I came up training in Okinawa, training karate, and most of the weapons there that they use are based on farm implements because a lot of Okinawans are farmers. Legend has it that the horse stance from the southern part of China was developed because a lot of folks would fight on boats and you had to have a low stance compared to the northern style where they have a higher stance so you'd have a lower center of gravity. Um, those stories sort of emblematize that every fighting situation is different. And that's part of why combat arts are never going to be a solved game. They will continue to evolve. And so if I roll with Kyle and he taps me with a footlock, I have to get better at footlocks. And oh, now, now I got to learn my footlock defense. Oh, wow, I don't teach that stuff that he just submitted me with. Maybe I should learn that and teach it. And as long as it continues to work and function, then it's going to be inherently evolving, ever changing, ever interesting. And nobody's ever going to know all there is to know about it, which for me is super exciting. So here's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with the earliest origins of jujitsu prehistory, what we know about that. We're going to then go to Jigoro Kano, starting to train in 1887, founding Kodokan Judo, uh, which was called Kano Jiu-Jitsu at the time. Really monumental figure who's fascinating uh, in the history of martial arts and society, even if he never, Kano is one of those figures who, even if he had never done martial arts, would still be a really impactful figure in world history. And he's one of my favorite guys in this whole story. Then we're going to talk about Mitsuyo Maeda, the famous Count Coma, and when he left for America, for Europe, for uh, and, and eventually Brazil in 1914. We'll talk about what happened in Brazil up until 1915, when capoeira was a major part of the Brazilian martial arts scene before Maeda arrived, and then how that changed after Maeda came, as well as some other uh, Japanese immigrants, which we'll talk about as well. 
Then we'll talk about Maeda and Soishiro Satake, as well as some of the other members of his troop that came to Brazil in 1915 and on, when the Count started training Brazilians. From there, uh, that's the, when the rise of the Gracies happened. We'll talk about the Gracies, of course, but we'll also talk about some little known figures, Jacinto Ferro, Donato Pires dos Reis, and some other folks who were around at the time. Uh, the Close Guard documentary is gonna go in depth on those folks, so I'm excited to introduce them to some of y'all. So you'll notice that Seven says Jiu-Jitsu comes to America again, starting with Carly Gracie in 1972 and Horian in 1978. Jiu-Jitsu came to America really early on, actually in the first part of the 20th century. And it's kind of an interesting thought experiment that we'll get into about what would have happened if it would have stuck around in America that first time. Because, uh, you know, as many of you know, President Roosevelt was really fascinated with Jiu-Jitsu. And finally, last part, we'll get to some of the stuff that animates a lot of us, the modern sports scene. And I'm not just talking about Jiu-Jitsu here. I'm talking about submission grappling, the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, the IBJJF, as well as, of course, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, which changed everything. So let's start first with Jiu-Jitsu's roots in feudal Japan. So we're talking about feudal Japan. The samurai were the military nobility uh, in medieval and pre-modern Japan. It's important to understand just a little bit about Japanese history at this time. And uh, so uh, we're going over a couple of historical things that are going to help you understand the, the, the context of the society in which this evolved. So feudal Japan was composed of regions, and those regions were ran by feudal lords or daimyo. Japan didn't get um, united until later, and we'll talk about why that mattered. Um, in uh, you know, and why that mattered in Jiu-Jitsu. The Samurai were also called Bushi, which just means warriors. Nope, the practice of the right. was broken. And so uh, we'll talk about some of those more parts and how they, yeah. might, how they might compare to where we are today. And by the way, if anybody, does anybody know how to mute all on this bad boy? Because, all right. Well, uh, if, you, if you're listening, if you could mute yourself, that'd be awesome. Uh, so, before, so before we talk about history, though, let's talk about some terminology. You notice that I'm spelling it jujitsu here, and that's because I'm using that to refer to the term as it was referred to in, in Japan. And so if you look at these three terms, you have jujitsu in the upper left, you have judo in the upper right, and then you have jujitsu, which is the term that most of us use. And I want to explain like why um, you'll see this spelled different ways. So the kanji character, that Chinese character on the left for ju, is the same for jujitsu and judo. It means gentle, pliable, or yielding, which is why jujitsu is usually translated as the gentle art, which is not super accurate because it doesn't mean gentle as in soft. Everybody here trains, so you understand jujitsu is not actually a soft or gentle art. It's more like pliable or adaptive, that it, it adapts to its environment, which I think is a lot more accurate. So the suffix there, jutsu arts are generally for fighting and do arts are generally for personal development. So even if the techniques don't vary too much, like judo practitioners do the sankaku jime, we do the triangle choke, even if the moves are the same, sometimes you use different terms to um, reflect the different philosophy and emphasis. Famously, and we'll talk about this a lot, Jigoro Kano did not like uh, professional fighting. And because he was an educator, he was the John Dewey of Japan, and he wanted to emphasize the physical education aspects of his art. And so that's hence the term judo. Now, he wasn't the first person to use the term judo. Uh, the Kito Ryu school of jiu-jitsu had been using the term since about the 18th century, in the mid-18th the mid century, about 1750 or so. And uh, in the early years, these terms overlapped a lot, um, but maybe because people were more familiar with one, or maybe because of differing philosophies. Point being, there are sort of two ways you can think of terminology. You can think of it as, I am gonna emphasize one part of this over another, like I'm gonna emphasize fighting with the jutsu, or I'm gonna emphasize this is an art of personal development or we practice for mutual welfare. And that's a way of sort of emphasizing, even if you're doing the same type of throw or the same type of submission technique, this is the way I view that throw, the view, the view of that technique. So later, and the way, I'm, the way I'm gonna use it is that when this art comes to the West where we speak Romance languages, we transliterate that to jujitsu, which is the term that you see down below. And so that's sort of just a note on terminology that some folks maybe find, find interesting. I wanna mention, and, and this is something that we will return to as well. When I think of jujitsu, right? We think of, I think of jujitsu as a, um, a, to me, it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy that is pliable, that you take a technique that is useful, you take a technique that you, um, and if it works, you keep it, if not, you adapt. 
Not really sure what's going on with that blue sir, that blue little squiggle in my screen that just appeared, but hey, we'll go with it. So now what y'all came for, let's start with the development of early jujitsu. So starting with the samurai in the, in about, you know, in the, in the 12th century, samurai practiced a variety of martial arts. They practiced uh, kendo, they practiced with weapons, they practiced archery, and there were grappling arts from a variety of regional schools that fell under the umbrella of jujitsu or jujitsu. Now there were, these schools were called Ryu. So remember Japan at the time, feudal Japan was not a centralized government. There were all these different regions. And so if we were in a region, our Ryu might look very different than the Ryu of a, a, you know, 100 miles to the west or 100 miles to the east. There were at least 170 documented Ryu or schools in feudal Japan, which makes it really tough to track exactly what those folks were doing. They varied in style, they varied in technique, they varied in emphasis. But generally speaking, if we're generalizing, there was an emphasis on throwing, as you see in the graphic, and control to use your secondary weapon. So jujitsu was the samurai art of unarmed combat. So if you didn't have your katana, your main sword, you could throw your opponent and use your secondary weapon, the wakazashi. Uh, or if you were unarmed, of course, you could use grappling techniques that were also effective and lethal. So a couple of notes from Japanese history. So the samurai emerged in the 12th century. There were upper class warriors um, that uh, emerged from the, the richer classes. And at that time, this regional society was dominated by feudal lords called daimyo that ruled specific regions. So the first guy to unify Japan was Oda Nobunaga, who, was the, who ruled over the daimyo, so the first what they called the shogun. But after Nobunaga's successor, Hideyoshi, died in 1598, there was a power vacuum because he didn't leave a strong heir. And so all these feudal lords went to war, and Ieyasu Tokugawa, who was the angry-looking dude in the image, he filled that vacuum and unified Japan under the Tokugawa shogunate, which would be the last shogunate in Japan. So why does this matter for jujitsu? It matters because Japan still had domains, uh, but they were unified. And finally, we start to see a central Japanese government. But what those domains did, those daimyo, those feudal lords, they funded martial arts schools. Now, they did this for obvious reasons, right? If you're a feudal lord, you need to make sure that your folks, particularly your army, can defend themselves. So they funded martial arts schools that paid professional instructors to teach that regional art. So this happened until the system collapsed in 1868. And why did it collapse? Well, at the time, Japan was a closed society until 1853 and 1854, until Commodore Matthew Perry took some warships to Japan to force the nation to open up to foreign trade. This leads to a lot of stuff, a lot of cultural exchange, leads to a lot of economic exchange, and one of the main exports, which is the martial art of Japan. But it has really, in really interesting internal effects as well, because when the feudal system collapses, there's no incentive for governments to fund martial arts schools before. So it becomes a lot harder to make a living as a martial arts instructor. So the samurai, uh, who are now illegal, rise up in 1877 and are destroyed. And the, at that time, and you know, obviously I'm glossing over a really interesting and complicated period in history, but uh, this period in Japanese history is called the Meiji Restoration. And the samurai continue to exist after that happens, but not really as warriors, mostly as upper-class clerks and administrators. And what happens in 1877 is the few warriors left take up the banner of the daimyo of Satsuma and they get destroyed utterly. And the leader of the uprising, a guy named Saigo Takamori, commits suicide that year, which puts a real someone just me too. So, I'm sorry. Oh. So, so anyway, so after Takamori commits suicide, and I think th there's some sort of synergies that happen here. Huh? That's the same year that Jigoro Kano begins training jujitsu, and so you sort of see almost a passing of the guard here. And so when Kano starts training, one thing that will become a theme of his life happens. He really starts to hate these traveling shows because a lot of martial artists at the time, if in 1868 you were making a living teaching jujitsu, and then suddenly the government who funded your dojo said, well, you, we can't pay you anymore. A lot of the way you would make a living is by doing traveling shows where you would do public demonstrations, you would do prize fights, and Kano hated that stuff and hated it for his whole life. But interestingly, this is probably where he saw jujitsu for the first time. This is also, so um, then in eight, later in 1882, he formally establishes the Kodokan, uh, and we'll, we'll get into some of the stuff around that if you want to come to the, the, uh, the class in two weeks when we talk specifically about Jiu-Jitsu in Japan.
So last date I'll talk about before we get into sort of the, the nitty gritty of the of how Japanese Jiu Jitsu starts becoming Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the Russo Japanese War breaks out. And this matters because stereotyping at the time is like, well, this Russia is this huge nation filled with a powerful military and Japan's a tiny island with smaller people. And when the Japanese win, it really spreads interest in Jiu Jitsu because people start thinking, wow, if this tiny island can beat this great military power, Surely they have hey, this commercial that stuff that's worth paying attention to. That's how you get this you coincidentally is also the same role. year that Mitsuya Maeda, Count Koma, leaves Japan and goes to America. And here's where we're gonna we're gonna talk about the great big divergence in judo and jiu-jitsu. So there's a quote from Kano that nothing under the sun is greater, greater than education. By educating one person and sending him into the society of his generation, we make a contribution extending a hundred generations to come. And this was his guiding philosophy, not just about martial arts, but life. And Yoshitsugu Yamashita, who will later become the first Kodokan Judoka in America and will teach President Roosevelt, agrees with Kano that we should make Judo known abroad as part of cultural exchange. So this was a divide between the two guys on the left, in quotes, and the four guys on the right. So you had Akitoro Ono, Mitsuyo Maeda, Tokuguro Ido, and Soshiro Satake, who, and Satake and Maeda leave Japan together in 1904. They were guys that were very much on the side of, we want to make a living doing this. So when feudalism um, collapsed, it really created an economic crisis in a lot of Japan and led to a lot of emigration. And so a lot of folks begin leaving Japan uh, Maeda will never return to Japan after 1904. The first Japanese arrive in Brazil in 1908. And these dudes in the picture are some of the most famous, although not the first guys to arrive in Brazil. But they do represent the main schism between Kano's high ideals of judo and the reality of making a living. Because Kano wanted judo to be physical education and he meant it to be shared with everyone for physical benefit, which was very consistent with the values he instilled at the Kodokan. But he was also an upper class guy who was a prominent educator who could afford his ethics and not everybody could. And so a couple things about that. You may, and some of the folks on the call may know this, but um, he would actually issue statements about how professional fighting was not allowed for Kodokan folks. A after Tokuguro Ido, who's the guy um, on, the, on, on uh, the far right there, after he takes a professional fight with pro wrestler Odd Santel in 1916, the Kodokan actually issues a statement against such matches. And it's unclear, there, there were always rumors that Maeda was unwelcome at the Kodokan because he took professional fights. Um, Maeda himself wondered if it was true. He heard rumors he'd been thrown out, although we can't say for sure. Uh, There's some indication that that was true, some indication it was not, but it's definitely true that Maeda had to take pro fights to survive and that, um, and that, uh, that Kano did not approve. And we'll get into that a little bit later too. So let's talk about how this wave of immigration starts to spread jujitsu in a bunch of different parts of the world. So when the jujitsu craze starts to happen after 1904, people get really interested because Japan wins the Russo-Japanese War. There's all this demand everywhere. And so like, as is repeated many times in history, you see people with varying degrees of qualifications purport to start teaching jujitsu. And so Sada Miyako is actually the first documented teacher in Brazil as of 1908. Maeda won't arrive until about six years later. And Sada Miyako is a really important figure in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which we'll get into next. Um, the, the, um, in the United States, and so Miyako is totally legit, you know, uh, trained judoka, very, very qualified to teach his art. In the United States, the first person to teach is John O'Brien, who teaches President Roosevelt in 1902. So O'Brien had been to Nagasaki for a couple of years as a part of a program uh, for cops that kept track of foreigners. So he was, he had had legitimate jujitsu training, definitely trained for a few years at what level and total knowledge is, is unclear, but he writes a very early book about jujitsu and he gets introduced to the president and teaches the president his first classes. Um, one of the things we'll go into in the Jiu-Jitsu in America class is Roosevelt will write some letters to his son Kermit about how awesome Jiu-Jitsu is, which some of you may have seen as a result of this. Um, so the guy on the right, uh, Edward Barton Wright, is the least qualified of these guys. And he was in Japan, but it's unclear if he trained or if so, how much. But when he returns to England, um, he starts teaching a martial art that he refers to as Bartitsu or Baritsu, named after himself, Barton Wright. And those of you that are Sherlock Holmes fans may be interested to know that Bartitsu is actually what Arthur Conan Doyle writes 
uh, into his books about how Sherlock Holmes beats Professor Moriarty and survives their, uh, their, their fight at the falls. It's actually in the story, which is pretty interesting. So although Barton Wright of these guys is the least qualified, he also does bring in, he has a, still has a very powerful legacy in jujitsu because he ends up bringing really qualified instructors in like Sadakazu Uyanishi, whose fight name is Raku. Raku will later go to Brazil with Maeda, very, very qualified guy. And Uyanishi will take over that school. Uyanishi then teaches Edith Garrett and her husband who will teach a generation of suffrage advocates in the United Kingdom. Uh, so all these guys end up being really important in martial arts history. So last thing on this, is that Maeda and uh, Sunajiro Tomita leave Japan for the US on, in 1904. They were sent to America first to help spread Kodokan Judo after the Japanese embassy uh, asks Kano to send a suitable instructor. Basically, the Japanese embassy says, hey, the president of the US is interested in our art. That's in our best interest. Can you send some guys that are legit? So Tomita and Maeda leave. Uh, Maeda never returns to Japan, although Tomita does. And so at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull back the camera just a second and ask you guys to think about two cool thought experiments. So Maeda in 1906 starts a school in New York City and his school basically fails. He only has 10 students at any given time because Maeda is not famous. He's not famous because he hasn't taken professional fights although he has done demonstrations at West Point in 1905 and places like that. So 1906 is the year Maeda starts taking professional fights because he has to make a living. So two things about that. First, think about what would have happened. And if, if any of you write alternate histories, imagine in 1906, Maeda, Maeda's school catches on in New York City and America becomes the center of jujitsu in the Western world, which is a crazy thing to think about. Now it doesn't happen and it doesn't happen because Maeda is not famous. So Maeda begins taking professional fights to sort of make ends meet, do barnstorming tours, do demonstrations. And these are really fascinating things in the development of the art. But one thing that is a term that uh, we all use, so Maeda's fight name was Count Coma or Conde Coma, which he starts using when he's on a tour in Europe. And when I first started training jujitsu, they told me that meant the Count of Combat. It's not what it means. It actually means, so the Japanese verb Komaru means to be in trouble, implying financial trouble. And so that's the root of it, is that Maeda was basically broke all the time. So he starts referring to himself as basically the count who is in financial trouble. So he needs to make a living. So that's thought experiment number one. So Maeda comes to America, he's unable to make a living doing it uh, in America, and he'll start doing barnstorming tours uh, after that. So let's talk about Brazil now. So Here's another interesting thought experiment. So Sada Miyako is the first jujitsu instructor in Brazil that we know of in 1908. There's some indication that, that, that there's some evidence and I'm waiting for, for Drysdale to, to, to confirm this, but like the, there's some indication that there may have been somebody sooner, but Sada Miyako is the first guy we know. So he arrives in 1908, starts performing shows, taking matches, doing sort of challenge fights. And he leaves in 1909. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu doesn't return in earnest to Brazil until Maeda comes, and of course everything changes after that in 1904. But I asked you to engage in a thought experiment with me about what if Jiu-Jitsu took root in America in 1906 instead of Brazil in 1914. Here's another thought experiment for you. At the time, um, Jiu-Jitsu is, or at the time, capoeira is considered the Brazilian national art. And I'm always interested in how nations sort of start to claim, hey, this is ours. This is what we do, how baseball becomes the American pastime. So at that time, capoeira is referred to in the popular press as Jogo Nacional, the national game. And I, by the way, those of you that haven't read Roberto Pedrero's books, uh, Craze and uh, Choque, or Choke, uh, are, um, that, those books are really excellent. And a lot of this information comes from there. Th although they're not the easiest reads if you're not an academic, What's really valuable about them is that Pedrera takes contemporary newspaper accounts from the time. So we know how people were talking about capoeira and jiu-jitsu at the time. And at this time, 1908, capoeira is like, this is our national art, our Brazilian national art. And this really takes hold in, 19, in 1908 when the cartoon in the upper left happens. So Miyako has a match 
with a uh, capoeira practitioner called Siriaco. And Siriaco does that stingray tail kick that you see on the right and knocks Miyoko unconscious. And so of course, you can see how the Brazilians would be all fired up about this. Like, hey, the Japanese art came, it lost to our Brazilian national art. It was a really big deal at the time, got written up in the newspapers. So now, and, and I'll, I'll go into this in just a second. Now, of course, Jiu-Jitsu starts winning all these matches later and the, culminating in this 1931 fight that we'll talk about in a second. But here's a fascinating thing for you to think about, right? Like what if Capoeira just kept winning, right? And what if, you know, it's possible we're all doing Capoeira today. Uh, now, at, anyway, and, and th there's other really interesting race and class dynamics with this. Brazil is the last um, nation in the West to abolish slavery in 1888. And so Capoeira developed out of that because it's this art that can be viewed as dance fighting because if you didn't want to get in trouble for training a deadly martial art, you would pretend to be dancing. Fascinating history there that I would like to know more about. And, uh, and you know, we'll talk about that history in one of the, the ensuing classes. So for me, this story is how jujitsu becomes the Brazilian national martial art supplanting capoeira. And what happens is after Siriaco wins, um, it's a big deal for a while, but after Maeda arrives, quickly capoeira starts losing these challenge matches. So Maeda himself destroys a capoeira fighter named Benjamin Constant Azevedo in 1915. He submits him very quickly in about four minutes. Satake, who is uh, Maeda's traveling partner, defeats another capoeirista called Petabola that same year. These fights happen in the Amazon, which could help to explain why jiu-jitsu took root there earlier than it did elsewhere in Brazil. So these fights keep happening and the jiu-jitsu guys keep winning. In 1908, Gio Omori, who was another really important Japanese fighter in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu history, also um, submits uh, a, a, a Brazilian fighter named Oswaldo Caetano Vasquez. This is important because when you look at the newspaper reports at that time in 1928 and 29, capoeira is clearly framed as the Brazilian art in advance of the fight. Then Omori submits it. And that's a real bummer for the people that were relying on that for Brazilian national pride. Which brings us to this 1931 fight with George Gracie versus Mario Aleixo. Now Mario Aleixo has been complaining that the capoeira fighters that you guys have been beating are not real capoeira fighters. They're not the best capoeira fighters. And Aleixo has been complaining that because qualified capoeira fighters hadn't been beaten, uh, that, you know, it's basically null and void. So the, once George Gracie beats him in 1931, though, that, those sort of complaints kind of get silenced. And Aleixo is also interesting because uh, Maedo is not, Ma Maeda doesn't go to Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro after 1916. And so Aleixo is actually teaching what he calls jujitsu at that time in that art. That's another side story for, for another day. But so those are two sort of interesting, to me at least, thought experiments about how, what if things went differently? What if jujitsu took hold in America first? What if uh, these fights between jujitsu and capoeira went a little bit different? So now let's talk again about the merits of professional fighting versus the merits of martial arts as education. Kano had a really particular perspective on this. And it's clear here. With judo, we have no professionals in the same sense as other sports. and No one is allowed to take part in public entertainment for personal gain. And so then on the right, you see Masahiko Kimura, who plays a really pivotal role in the story, doing a demonstration as part of a professional fight. So one thing to think about is that one, you know, because people always ask, okay, what, when people, why was Maeda saying what he was teaching was jujitsu? Some people say, well, that's because jujitsu is a fighting art. And Maeda was saying, what I'm doing is fighting and I'm teaching you how to fight. Some people say, well, he knew that Kano would not approve if he were saying, I'm a judo fighter and I'm fighting. And so he used jujitsu to sort of distinguish himself from those Kodokan techniques. It's also very clear that as Maeda is doing these sort of prize fighting and barnstorming tours, that he is fighting and training with catch wrestlers, with sambists with uh, just street fighters at the time. And so the techniques that he is learning and teaching are certainly changing and evolving. In some of these fights, strikes are involved and some of them they're not. The rules are sort of wild west. And so how much um, his, you know, and, and Robert Drysdale's take on this is that Maeda is basically teaching Kodokan Judo at this point, but it's 
I'm not sure how we can know that for sure, because it's also clear that he is training and, you know, you, you, everybody here, everybody here trains, right? And so everybody here has gone to school, to a school that trains different techniques than you do and been influenced by them. And so imagining a guy leaving Japan in 1904 and landing in Brazil 10 years later, having gone everywhere and challenged everybody, you can see how that art could have evolved during that time. And so, you know, again, when you use a term judo or jujitsu, sometimes you're doing that to differentiate what I'm doing is for fighting or what I'm doing is for personal development. But sometimes it's also a, hey, my techniques are also changing and evolving. So let's talk about the time frame. This is another fascinating thing that we're learning a lot more about. And our understanding of this time frame has evolved a lot since the, the Pedrero books came out and since Jose Tufi Cairus's academic dissertation came out a few years ago. But there's a few things that everybody agrees on. So Maeda arrives in Brazil in November of 1914. He's already traveled to the US, the UK, he's been in Cuba, he'll go to Cuba later and do his last professional fight in 1922. He's been putting on shows and he's been fighting. He'll basically go do demonstrations. Those demonstrations include self-defense, those demonstrations include throws, and he'll challenge guys in the audience for anybody who thinks they can beat me. If you beat me, you get a certain amount of money. If an amateur can last 15 minutes with me, they get a certain amount of money to prove the effectiveness of his art. When he arrives in Brazil, he starts teaching. And Carlos Gracie, and this is something that's been of some, some controversy, is how much Carlos Gracie actually trained with Mitsuya Maeda. So what we know for sure is that he's in uh, Brazil in 1914, and he starts teaching for sure in 1915. And his best student is this guy Jacinto Ferro, down here on the right. Now, Jacinto Ferro is an Italian immigrant who is a bicyclist and a, a weightlifter. This is the only photo that we know we have of him, big buff guy with an awesome mustache. He will later be described in press reports as Maeda's complete student. So we know that, that Carlos starts training in 1920, and he and the family are in moved to Rio in 1922. So he's around Maeda and his school for that two-year period, training with probably Jacinto Ferro and the gentleman on the left, Donato Paristos Hayes, who we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and he, so anyway, uh, let, let's actually just talk about Donato for a second, because uh, in, in the interest of time. So by 1922, Carlos and his family uh, leave and move to Rio. And by Carlos's own account, he doesn't train again for six years until 1928. So what happens in 1928? So the guy right here in the center, Donato Paristos Hayes, Kant, who is an old training partner of, of Carlos's, contacts Carlos and asks him to start teaching jujitsu with him to teach, he has a contract to teach police. And so Carlos begins becoming uh, his assistant instructor. In 1930, they open an academy in Rio, and Carlos and George here are listed in academy communications and press reports as uh, Donato's assistants. So for some reason, uh, the families have a falling out. We don't know why, but we know that Paris is gone the next year. And by 1932, the academy is being referred to as the Academy of Gracie. And that is where the Academy of Gracie comes from. Elio starts training. And almost immediately starts taking challenge matches. His first one is in 1932, when he arm locks Antonio Portugal in about 30 seconds. And I'm going pretty fast here. I apologize. I, I, there, there's just a lot to cover. But I want to take a breath and take a pause here and talk about um, Elio Gracie's vision of jiu-jitsu. Because those of us that have trained in sort of, you know, I, for those of you that don't know, I, I, I'm a black belt under Seth Champ, who is a Hoist Gracie black belt. I've been in the Hoist Association for my whole career. And Elio Gracie's view of jujitsu was as a self-defense art that should work in no rules situations. And this is important to understand because, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, jujitsu evolves. And when, whether you view something as a sport or as a martial art, or as some combination matters very much. In a sport, there are rules. And one of the main interesting things that happens in Brazil at this time is the understanding of rules evolves. But to Elio, this was always about a martial art that was about survival and that was about self-defense, which is sort of a clash with some of the other common views about what judo and jujitsu was for. And I think the best way to explain that is to talk about his fights with Ono. Uh, one of the Ono brothers. And the so he takes his first fight in 1932. 
And I should say at this time, uh, the rules of these fights are really mutable and changeable. And part of the reason when you look at press reports, a lot of these fights are very controversial is that the, the, the matches have to be negotiated, the terms of the matches. So if you were competing in Japan at the time, it was a very organized competition scene. Everyone understood the rules. Everyone understood what the, the legal techniques were. Everyone understood what the kimono was. Once it starts uh, coming abroad, people have very different levels of comfort with what's happening. So some fighters, like, like Carlos Gracie, really always wanted to fight in a gi. Joe Omori didn't mind fighting no gi. Some of these matches, it was clearly understood were valet tudo matches where anything went. Some of the matches, um, that was not the understanding. Some of the, and, and, and so the reason I mentioned that is that Elio's perspective from the beginning is he wants to, he doesn't believe in point fighting. He believes that submission, that, that we should be able to fight with no rules and when, and, and if you can't finish me, Basically, that's the only thing Elio is concerned about. So some of these early fights, the, the, the big fight that I want to talk about, and well, there's a lot of fights I want to talk about, but unfortunately, we don't have time. The, so Elio's fights with Yasuito Ono mark a significant rule shift. To a lot of the Japanese fighters, throws were it, because under the judo rule set, that was, you know, you could win that way. And so in Elio's fights with Ono, he gets thrown a lot. But to the Japanese fighter, that's what he's been training for, to, to throw. But he's unable to finish Elio in Newaza, which to Elio is the point of it. And so that is where the sort of culture clash happens and where, in my mind, the divide between what we know as judo or jujitsu generally and Gracie jujitsu becomes most pronounced because Elio doesn't care if he gets thrown as long as he doesn't get finished. So... Elio retires in 1937 uh, from fighting, but the, but as you uh, you know, no professional fighter ever stays retired, particularly not in the 30s. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of fights that you have almost certainly heard about. And if you haven't, boy, are you in for a treat. So Elio, the so Masahiko Kimura was one of the most accomplished judoka ever, and one of the most famous fighters of his generation, uh, comes with a troop to Brazil. And Elio challenges Kimura. Now, Elio, uh, Kimura says that Elio has to, before, before he'll fight Elio, who's uh, coming out of retirement to, to fight, that he has to face his countryman Yukio Kato first. So he and Kato have two fights. And the first fight goes to a draw. Nobody submits anybody. And the second fight, which is, I think, well, with the Ono fights, probably the most significant fight in Elio's career and definitely his most impressive win, Elio chokes Kato unconscious. And he does it with a, a simple collar choke that's still on the fundamentals curriculum of every jiu-jitsu academy in America. And nobody like outside of Brazil really expected this to happen. And so I think for, for me, it's definitely Elio's signature win. Um, and it gets him the fight with Masahiko Kimura. So if you haven't seen the fight with Masahiko Kimura, you can click that button there. We're not going to watch it today, but Kimura may be one of, uh, of, of it. I think it's, it's probably Elio's most famous fight, even though he loses. He gets submitted in 13 minutes uh, by a technique that the judo folks call Udegarami. Of course, we know it today as the Kimura because people start referring to it as that after he submits Elio. And it's still more or less a win for Elio, at least in the popular imagination, because Kimura is a bigger, a, a bigger guy. He's about 25, 30 pounds heavier than Elio, and he's world renowned as one of the best. And so, as you can see, there's some mutual respect there. So skip, so skipping ahead a little bit. So that's, so that's 1951, and Elio retires. Well, he, he'll fight Valdemar Santana, but we'll, we'll get into that in another time. So Elio retires again in the 50s, and this really, the generation of the fifth, uh, the, the decade of the 50s becomes a real golden age of jiu-jitsu. There's a lot of fights, jiu-jitsu becomes very popular, and a new generation of very popular fighters starts. Carlson Gracie, a uh, senior, uh, who has a, a famous rivalry with his uncle and, and his uncle's academy, begins fighting in the 50s. Hobson Gracie, who most folks won't, who is actually one of the most interesting figures in jiu-jitsu history, and is the father of Henzo, Half, and Hyen, uh, he also starts fighting in the 50s. And so it's a real sort of glory decade for the Gracies. In the 60s, 
that changes a bit. And it changes for a couple of reasons that will be familiar to those of you. So this is a jujitsu crowd, right? So everybody who is a jujitsu artist who has watched professional MMA has heard that deadly phrase, stand them up ref from somebody who doesn't train. And it's because folks that don't grapple aren't always educated about what good grappling looks like. And so for those of us that train, a fight between, let's say, Hoist Gracie and Dan Severn is an absolutely fascinating martial display between two high-level grapplers that are both trying not to give an inch and submit each other. But um, to somebody that doesn't train, it just looks like two dudes laying on the ground and they don't understand what's going on. So something similar happens to in Brazil in the 60s as jiu-jitsu fades from prominence. People start to prefer striking arts that they consider more entertaining from the professional fighting uh, in the professional fighting arena. So if you're going to watch a professional fight, you're probably not going to want to watch a jiu-jitsu fight during this time. In the sport aspect of things, judo is growing in popularity because judo becomes a demonstration sport in the Olympics at that time, which causes the popularity of judo to grow and jiu-jitsu is diminishing due to this exposure as well as other factors. Some of the other factors include the way jiu-jitsu is perceived in Brazil at the time. Um, jiu-jitsu starts to get a bad rap because of some hooliganish behavior that we'll do a deeper dive into in another class. But the 70s is where the move to America starts. Uh, uh, and that's something that is uh, that I'm deeply grateful for because it's, it's why we're training all today. So it starts actually with Onika Gracie, who is the daughter of Carlos and Lita, who does not train, but helps some of her brothers and cousins move to America. The first Gracie to move to America is Carly Gracie up in the upper right in 1972. Uh, Horian, who is perhaps more responsible than anyone else for the growth of jujitsu in the USA and maybe worldwide, um, comes in 1978. So when Horian comes, he comes to, to work in Hollywood and make his fortune. He comes with very little money in his pocket, but he begins working as an extra, as a stunt coordinator, does some fight choreography. Actually, for those of you that are as old as me, I turned 46 this year. You may remember that Horian does a guest spot on, the episode of, on an episode of Three's Company, which you can Google. It's on YouTube. Uh, younger folks, you don't know what Three's Company is. You're not missing out. But Horian does some, some work in Hollywood. And at that time, he starts teaching jujitsu out of his garage. The first person to regularly train with him is Richard Bresler there on the right. He's been on the podcast. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I have a podcast called Dirty White Belt Radio. I've interviewed most of these folks. Richard Bresler uh, was a really fascinating interview because imagine starting training jujitsu in 1979 with Horian Gracie. Dude has some incredible stories. So the reason that I bring up Carly is not just because he was first to teach jujitsu here. He teaches to some of the American military, he teaches in Florida, teaches in Arizona, but um, a really famous thing that happens that causes a lot of uh, strife within the family uh, is that Horian starts to try to trademark the term Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And so in 1994, Carly sues him in Gracie versus Gracie and wins a trademark lawsuit. Um, so basically saying, you know, because Carly was the first person here train teaching Gracie Jiu Jitsu that, that Horian cannot trademark it. The first American black belt is a guy named Craig Kukuk. And uh, Craig is actually, like, I've talked to him on the phone a couple times, really interesting guy. Unfortunately, like, he's, like, there, there are a few people that I've always wanted to have on the podcast that just won't come on, and he's one of them. And uh, Guy has some fascinating, fascinating stories. So I, I already mentioned, like, imagine being a jujitsu guy training in 1979 in America with Horian. Craig Kukuk got his black belt in 1992. In 1992, Right? That's a year before the Ultimate Fighting Championship. So imagine being a black belt in great C Jiu Jitsu at that time in America. Uh, really, really important time in American history, as well as Jiu Jitsu history. But I already mentioned the thing that changed everything, which most of the folks on this call are aware of, which is the first Ultimate Fighting Championship in 1993. And, uh, you know, I watched it. I think a lot of people that train were inspired to train by the Ultimate Fighting Championship because. Um, it's the night that, re that really changed everything when jujitsu came out onto the main stage. Before this happened, if you weren't in California or if you didn't have the opportunity to luck into someone teaching uh, as part of the military, you didn't really have an opportunity to train jujitsu and you probably didn't even know what it was. But essentially what happens is Horian wants to prove the effectiveness of his family's martial art for a, um, for a wide audience. And so Hoist Gracie, uh, who goes undefeated at the first four Ultimate Fighting Championships, is the family's selected person uh, to go and fight. 
And so I, I, to some of you all, uh, th this is going to be a lot of review, but but I think this is really important. And as a guy in his 40s, I find that a lot of folks that just started training in the last 10 years don't know about how significant this was. So because the UFC has been around forever, it's a multi-billion dollar business now, and it's sort of everywhere. But I don't think folks like broadly understand how wild and revolutionary this was at the time. For one thing, there were no rounds, there were no timers, there, and there were effectively no rules. You basically locked two men in a cage and said, one of you is going to either give up or be rendered unconscious, and that is the only way you can win, very much in keeping with Elio Gracie's philosophy of self-defense and jujitsu. And so there's two things about this. If this sounds brutal, it's because it was brutal. The only techniques that weren't you know, there were no techniques that were technically illegal, but some of the things that, you know, groin strikes were legal. Famously, Joe Sun gets finished, uh, deservedly so, by Keith Hackney uh, with like 20 groin strikes in a row. I, although some techniques like eye gouging were technically illegal, the punishment was not disqualification. It was a fine. So you got fined like 500 bucks. And so this was not good for mass consumption. But what was it good for? It was essentially an academic study about what martial art is most effective in no rules situations. Because you know th there are no time limits, there are no forbidden techniques, and so there are really no excuses, right? You either win or you lose. Um, and I, I mentioned that because I think it, it like, uh, and so I guess I am gonna go off on this rant. So when you think about public, like martial arts for entertainment, right? There are two poles. I want you to imagine like two poles and one is pure entertainment and one is pure effectiveness. Ideally, you want a sweet spot, but that which is really effective is not always entertaining to watch for a mass audience, right? If you show the Hoist Gracie Dan Severn fight to a bunch of grapplers, they will say, man, how effective, what incredible use of the grappling arts. If you show it to a mass audience, it's not going to be, be very well received. And so that's sort of why the UFC today um, has rounds, they score with the 10 point must system, much like boxing, because those are sort of concessions to entertain. But at the time that didn't really happen. It was all about um, effectiveness. So Hoist beats three guys. Uh, he wins three fights in one night. That's another thing that doesn't happen anymore. He beats Art Jimerson, who was a national Golden Gloves middleweight champion. Uh, he gets made fun of a lot because he chooses to fight with one glove so he can jab with that one glove. Looks kind of goofy. Uh, Ho Hoist submits him uh, to, with mount pressure, actually. Second fight, and this is one of Hoist's signature fights, he beats Ken Shamrock. Now, Ken is a legend of MMA and a real MMA pioneer, somebody that deserves a ton of respect. Not only is he a veteran of submission fighting, fought in Japan, he also founded the Lions Den, which was the first real fight camp at the time, and like getting dudes together to train together. And as you can see, was built like a Greek god. Hoist submits him with a rear naked choke uh, that I still teach in the fundamentals class today. Um, and his final fight is against Gerard Gordeaux, who is a really badass kickboxer, uh, about a 210 pound guy, Dutch kickboxing champion, European savat champion, world savat champion. And because I mentioned the no biting, gouging, I, all that stuff was, was legal, but you would get fined for it. Hoist's final fight is against Gordeaux. And when I talk about larger than life figures, Hoist and Gordeaux are, are definitely that. A lot of people gave Hoist a lot of static because Hoist did not let go of the choke when Gordo tapped, he rear naked chokes him. And Gordo has to tap like 10 times before Hoist will let go. John McCarthy has to pull Hoist off of him. And what a lot of people don't know is the reason Hoist was doing that was not to be a jerk. It was because Gordo was biting Hoist and Hoist was mad. So he tucked his chin and tried to bite Hoist's bicep to defend the choke, which sort of tells you a lot about the fight environment at the time. So those of us that were around then and were watching were blown away by how effective jujitsu was. Hoist is far and away the smallest of these three men. He's like 170 pounds at the time. And we didn't understand what was going on. We just knew that it worked. Then they ran it back in UFC two. In UFC two, Hoist won four fights in one night against Minuki Ichihara, Jason Delucia, Remco Pardue, and Pat Smith. And that really launched the prominence of jujitsu in America. So what was the aftermath of this? The success of jujitsu uh, of this first UFC uh, launched a billion dollar industry, which is modern mixed martial arts. Everybody knows what the UFC is now. It's not just for martial arts nuts anymore. It also did exactly what Horian intended. It catapulted Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to prominence. It served as a commercial for his family's art. 
It also sets the stage for other forms of competitive submission grappling for entertainment, some of which bear more resemblance to Gracie Jiu Jitsu than others. And I'll get into that in a second. But one of the things that is awesome about this time, and as much as people complain about things like flow grappling or, or, or EBI or things like that, to have this many competitive submission grappling things available for entertainment where you can watch some incredible athletes do their thing, it's unbelievable. I couldn't even have imagined it 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So um, this UFC one in 1993 sets off essentially a revolution where in 1998, uh, Sheikh Tanun bin Zayed founds the Abu Dhabi Combat Club. And so that's the submission wrestling championship, which you see here uh, on the left. And then uh, there's the Eddie Bravo Invitational now streaming on Fight Pass. And let me see if I can get this to play because this looks very much like, like this could be from a Vale Tudo fight in Brazil in the 1950s, right? Got two guys aggressive there's takedowns and this is a scene from ebi where it's very famous dudes double guard pull at the same time and so i am not going to say that one is right or one is wrong because here's the thing martial arts adapt and evolve and evolution doesn't mean survival of the most fit evolution means survival that is most fit to the environment the thing that succeeds is the thing that adapts most to its environment so in the same way that Elio Gracie adapted to Japanese men being able to throw him around because they've been training throws since they were five. And he's like, well, you might be able to throw me, but you can't submit me. And if we get on the ground, I can submit you. The same way that that happens, rule sets start to drive behaviors. And so if you're in a submission only match, like with the EBI rules, takedowns begin to not matter as much. And so all of this is to say, this is why I consider jujitsu a philosophy, a philosophy of adaptation. And that's what jujitsu means to me. It means finding the most efficient way to solve whatever problems you have. If the problem is I don't want to feel unsafe walking down the street, I'm gonna train entirely on self-defense, great. If I'm a competitive athlete, and you're asking me to compete under this rule set that is called Eddie Bravo Invitational Rules, okay, I will adapt to that and I will develop a strategy. I will develop a practice that helps me to succeed in whatever endeavor that I want. And for me, that applies not just to martial arts, but life. That for me is the most powerful lesson of jujitsu that if you try hard enough, you can find the most efficient and effective way to solve whatever problem you have. And that's why I love jujitsu, y'all. And that is why we train. So that's almost the end of the presentation. And I want to thank you for your kind attention. I'd be happy to have some dialogue, take some questions. Just want to say a couple of other things, which is thanks for listening. That's my email address. Please hit me up if you have any questions. We can also talk after this and all unmute ourselves and stuff. I have listed uh, some of the folks that I used their work to make this presentation. It really wouldn't be possible without Jose Tufi Kairos, without Robert Drysdale, Roberto Pedrera, John Stevens, many others. Support Jiu-Jitsu History, buy these dudes books, buy, watch Closed Guard when it comes out. At bellyhambjj.com, I have a blog post with all the links. So if you're interested on any other stuff that, uh, that I talked about here, you can find it there. Lastly, if you enjoyed this, which I hope you did, and I'm really grateful to you all for your kind attention, we can do deeper dives on every Tuesday night at 6 if you want. So if you want to come back on the night, we're going to talk about jiu-jitsu in Japan from 1600 to 1904. We'll talk about how, and, and Kano is really one of my absolute favorite people in history, so I love talking about him. We'll talk about that then. On the 16th, we'll talk about Mitsuo Maeda, Count Koma, and the Japanese diaspora. We'll talk about Sada Miyako, about Raku, about Sitake, about uh, Joe Omori, about the Ono brothers. And we'll talk about one of my other favorite uh, people in martial arts history, Edith Garrett, who is the, famous as the suffragette who knew jujitsu, bodyguard to Emmeline Pankhurst, the British suffragist, and a uh, sort of side figure in the movie Mary Poppins, which is also super fun. We'll talk about uh, President Theodore Roosevelt and fighters on a lot of continents. On the 23rd, we'll talk all about the Gracies, about generations and generations of Gracies, um, without whom, honestly, most of us would not be training. And then finally, on the 30th, right before hopefully our academy reopens again, We'll talk about modern sport fighting and how the UFC informed the rise of ADCC, of the IBJJF, of EBI, and all these other little promotions about these other different rules. And we will hopefully try to answer the question, who is the greatest of all time? And how do we know that? So y'all, um, just let me express my thanks one more time. I had a blast pulling this together. I had a blast presenting it. I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so y'all can see my
face, which is not a feature, it's a bug. But, um, but yeah, that's it. And so if, if you have any questions or want to bring things up, I, oh, I didn't see the chat. Oh, the chat's awesome. Oh, and thank you y'all for posting, posting the links. I'm sorry for not, 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 uh, not paying attention to the chat. Hey, Jeff, I have a question. Hit me up. Um, so it, it's kind of a, it might be too deep of a dive and it's fine if you, if you don't want to go into it, but, um, it's, it's a story that Dave talks about as well in, in the history of, of kind of like moves being named after people. And you mentioned the Kimura, right? And, and it's, it's, it's like, obviously there's a place in history. And, and I was wondering if you could kind of like um, compare and contrast that with the, the Sakuraba, mm -hmm. which, which as we know is it's, it's also kind of a Kimura and he's also a, a figure who was, you know, quote unquote the Gracie Hunter and if that's something that like we could go into at some point if 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 you feel the inclination. Absolutely. And let me just give you my capsule summary of that. And Sakuraba is also one of the, the most interesting folks to talk about in martial arts history. So I agree with Dave generally we shouldn't name moves after people because people are fallible and because it's not that that person usually invented the move. It's that's the first person you saw the move. That being said, we're as human beings, we need shorthand. Right. And so often our shorthand is like, I saw that move. I saw Alio get submitted with that. Who did that? Oh, Kimura. That's the Kimura. Right. Or like, like the move that on my own plot of DVD that I call the, uh, the, uh, the call Space Mountain. I used to call it the Michael Lange because I saw Michael Lange do it. And I took a seminar with Michael Lange. He's like, I didn't invent that man. And I was like, you know, and, and, and so it, uh, my students know this, but I say I have three wishes world peace and into hunger and standardized jujitsu nomenclature because. I don't want to un not understand what a honey hole is when other people call it a 411 and other people call it another thing, right? Uh, but, but yeah, I generally agree with Dave that, uh, yeah, and my, I'm, I'm seeing the chat now. Oh, you guys are awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for the nice chats. But yeah, Jesse, I, I agree with Dave. I don't think we should name moves after folks, but it's also understandable, right? Like if you see Sakuraba and you see him do that Kimura, you're like, oh man, or that, yeah, then, then you identify it with him, understandably. Chris Amico, absolutely correct. Only two hard things in jujitsu: escaping side control and naming things. Yeah. So y'all, uh, does anybody, it, like, I'm going to scroll through the chat real quick and just see, and thanks Richard for posting all the, uh, the resources and links uh, in the chat. Uh, these, these, these are great. Um, I'm going to consume all the stuff that I haven't consumed. I'm looking forward to Richard Bresler's book as well. Um, and yeah. Does anybody else have any, any other questions or any suggestions? Or, uh, yes, like, I always want to know how this could be better. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Jeff, either now or in a future session, can you differentiate Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Gracie Jiu Jitsu? Yeah, I can do that right now. And, and here's the thing like, candidly, um, it's about equal parts substantive distinction and marketing, right? And we know marketing is important because Horian tried to trademark the name Gracie Jiu-Jitsu because there's power in naming, right? If you're like, this is the name and you own it, that, that's a valuable asset. When I came up, and you know, everybody knows I, I ended up training at a Hoist Gracie school, is that the way that the Gracies, Hoist and some of the other self-defense Gracies, the way they think of it is that Jiu-Jitsu generally, they think of as a sportive grappling art. Whereas Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, they think of as a self-defense art that includes striking, takedowns, weapons defenses, philosophy, and that sort of thing. And so, and I think that is, and for me, I'm about 50-50 on it because I think a lot of it is marketing, but I think a lot, but I think that's also a meaningful distinction. And the, the only reason that I, I, I won't go so far as to say that that is a 100% meaningful distinction is that for me, there is the naming of things and the substantive meaning of things. And so if what you mean, and people use the word jujitsu to mean many different things, which I was trying to define my terms. So for me, jujitsu is fundamental. Like for me, I take a, glow, a, a really broad approach for what jujitsu is. I think jujitsu does include self-defense. I do think it includes weapons defense. I think it includes takedowns, throws, philosophy, striking, all that stuff. If you go to a lot of jujitsu schools in America, though, you'll just learn grappling. Now, there's nothing wrong with just learning grappling, right? Grappling is awesome. We have a lot of fun and, and we enjoy it and we do it. And if you want to be a competitive sport grappler, that's exactly where you should be. 
that being said, there are some schools that, that, and, and for me, that's more of uh, an issue of substance than an issue of naming. So for me, when people say Gracie Jiu Jitsu, what they mean is you can come to the school and be assured that you will learn self-defense, that you will learn weapons defenses and all that stuff. Whereas you, that might be true if you just go to a place that is called Jiu Jitsu, you might learn all that stuff too. Or you might go to a place that's like, hey guys, we're competing at the IBJJF tournament. Here's the Baron Bolo. Here's the, the, the 50-50 guard. I also want to be, and I hope that makes sense. I also want to be careful and, and, and say, I hope it's coming across that I'm not attaching like a good or bad value to either of those things. For me, life and jujitsu is about your goals. If your goal is to be a competitor, you should go to a sport only school, right? And you, if that's what you care about, man, you know, you don't need to be learning how to, you know, defend a knife. Uh, but if your goal, like my goal personally is to have good, solid, fundamental jujitsu over the long term, which means uh, I want to know everything about it. Jack Kerouac said about America that as a writer, his subject is America. And so he has to know everything about it. And that's how I feel about jujitsu. I just, I just want to know it all. Did I answer the question you actually asked or did I just talk for a while? No, you, you, you did. You know, it, it's, it's like, um, there, there is some, what I've read is that uh, Gracie jujitsu is more efficient and I have yet to see an explanation of here's this move done in jujitsu, and then Gracie Jiu Jitsu is so much better. Like I haven't seen that comparison. That part is marketing, um, to be to be candid. Like all jujitsu is about efficiency. Um, and 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 like the all, jujitsu should be about efficiency and about effectiveness, right? Like, does it work? And is it the most efficient way to get it to work? And so uh like the, the, the distinction that I think is the most meaningful is like, are you gonna learn the self-defense too? And that, that's the most, the biggest substantive distinction that I've, that, I, that I've seen personally. Thank you. Sure, man. Hey, Jeff. <clears throat> Hit me. Um, I was curious, um, cause Teddy Roosevelt, before he was taught judo was um, very much into like American style catch wrestling. Um, how did those two compare in, in efficacy? That, that's a great, the, I'm so glad you asked. And by the way, awesome Zoom background. So uh, the, the Roosevelt Center actually has the original letters that he wrote to his son and his friend about it. And basically what Roosevelt says is, this art is way better than our art. He's like, our, our men would still beat these men because we are bigger and stronger, but we don't know this stuff and we should know this stuff. And, and, like, and so he writes to his son about this and says basically that he's like, the art of jujitsu is worth more than our arts. He's like, our guys might still win because they're big and strong and wrestling is great, but we need to learn these submission techniques. And Yamashita, when he ends up teaching, Roosevelt helps him get a contract with the US Navy because Roosevelt is so convinced that we need to learn this as American fighters or else we'll be at a disadvantage. And when the Navy wants to cancel his contract, Roosevelt actually stops them and so that's why he ends up staying in america until 1907 and so so roosevelt was a big believer in uh, and richard has a really good link uh in in the chat there and i haven't read that link but i'm sure it's awesome i'll check it out in a minute but i really encourage you like honestly just go to the roosevelt center because they have his original letters and it's just awesome because it's like sort of being transported to a bygone era where he's like the manly art of jujitsu is you know and 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 uh did i answer the question you actually asked sweet Thank you. Other stuff, y'all? Let me, man, it's so good to see all y'all. Can't wait till I can see all y'all and train with all y'all. <laughs> all right, good people. Well, you Here guys will get an open I... mat before we do, so <laughs> driving up. <laughs> You're always welcome. And Richard has another great Roosevelt quote in the uh, in the chat. So, uh, so yeah. And well, y'all, um, we hope to be open July first. Uh, our our reopening plan is up on the website. Uh, Whatcom County is in phase two now. We hope to be in phase three soon. Um, we're going to do these classes up until July first, regardless. So please do join me. I had a great time. I'm glad you. All, I'm glad to see so many folks. And uh, yeah, thanks again for checking it out. If, if there's anything that I didn't get to, or if you think of anything that you want to know that you wish you would ask me about, just email me and we'll do it up. And if not, um, have a great time, stay healthy and uh, go train when you can. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much, Jeff. Thanks y'all. Take care. Thanks, man. Thank Thanks, you, Jeff. Thanks guys.
Oh, it's okay. I know. Uh. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. What's up, T? You like it? Oh my God, that was so informative. 